Science has a communication obstacle. More accurately, the obstacle is creating entry points for understanding. Entry points are the language used, activities done, and images viewed that allow those without the training, background, or jargon to engage with what's being communicated. Entry points are doorways into new worlds of understanding and experience. Albert Einstein himself once said, it would be possible to describe everything scientifically, but it would make no sense. It would be without meaning, as if you described a Beethoven symphony as a variation of wave pressure. My friend, Dr. Eileen Hebbett, studies, quote, the diversity associated with communication systems, with concentration and intraspecific communication relating to reproductive behavior. Trust me, it's super cool and way more interesting than it sounds. In regular human speech, it means she studies the interesting and myriad ways creatures communicate through mating rituals. And her creatures of choice are arachnids. If you walk into her laboratory, you'll find a room with three walls stacked to the ceiling, filled with terrariums containing thousands of arachnids and other spiders. For an arachnophobe, it's a pure nightmare. Yet for Eileen, she loves spiders. Not only is her research helping us understand more of the natural world, it is helping us understand the complex yet elegant solutions nature has served up to problems of design and function. There is so much we don't understand yet about the world, and she is one of many scientists helping us figure it out. Her challenge is how to communicate the importance of her research, because it is critical for scientists to communicate the importance of their research. They have to communicate well in order to secure grant funding, share their findings with industry, and to teach and enlighten the public. Entry points into scientific thought are vital, because as Einstein said, they can't just communicate scientifically it would lack meaning. Which begs the question, what is the best way to do this? What if the arts came alongside science to create the entry points? What if music and dance could help Eileen share her research with a greater audience? A few years ago, UNL Associate Professor of Dance Susan Orida and I created a magical collaboration that transformed Eileen's data into something new, emotional, and powerful. And that is why I'm in front of you today. I want you to experience a new entry point to scientific thought. I also want you to experience a transformative collaboration between science, dance, and music. I also want to ask a few important questions along the way, such as, why is it that the arts can create these entry points? And what is it about the arts, and music specifically, that allows it to transform concepts and ideas into emotional experiences? And what does it look like when the artistic experiences create opportunities to connect with the natural world? Because here's the thing. The arts don't need ideas. Ideas need the arts to become even more powerful. So why does art influence people in this way? And how can the sciences leverage it to their advantage? First of all, the arts, and especially music, are emotional. By that I mean they heighten and can even manipulate the emotional responses of viewers and listeners. Studies have shown that people listen to music because of the emotional and physiological responses it causes in them. Both John Sloboda of Keele University and Carol Krumhansel of Cornell University have proven this to be true. In those they studied, the emotional and physiological responses ranged from laughter to tears, and from anxiety to chills. Science has also shown that music aids in memory formation. What this means is that music, when paired with another experience, makes that experience more and sticky. It heightens the response and aids in creating deeply held memories. This is also why filmmakers marry their images with music and why many of your most emotional and deeply held memories can be resurfaced by hearing a particular piece. Who doesn't well up with tears when Miguel sings Remember Me to his great-grandmother at the end of Pixar's Coco? Or has their heart rate increased and adrenaline coursed through their body at the opening chord and fanfare at the start of every Star Wars movie? Or has feelings of love and passion recreated in you when you hear the song that was playing when you first held hands with or kissed your partner? Our emotional responses stick to what we are seeing, hearing, feeling, and tasting when coupled with music. Now let me bring this back to where I started. I claimed earlier that science has an obstacle in creating entry points for understanding. So what does it look like when the arts comes alongside science 
and the art steals in emotional responses and creates those entry points? Well, it makes science more accessible. The arts are one way, perhaps a wonderful way, to create doorways to help people engage with science in new ways. The arts also help people who normally would not engage with science to begin interacting with it. When I have shared the music and dance that I'm about to share with you, people without fail respond with at least two comments. First, I never knew spiders could make so much sound. And second, I've never thought of spiders as beautiful before. We have opened the door to a new level of understanding of the natural world and the creatures that literally surround us. Therefore, we have established that a marriage between science and the arts is a good idea, maybe even a great idea. The next step was to figure out exactly how to do that. For my part, I had music to write and questions I had to answer before I could even begin, such as, what does music based on spiders even sound like? And how am I going to transform scientific research into art? I decided to start with the audio and video recordings of the arachnids that Eileen had produced in her lab. You'd be stunned and possibly even horrified to learn just how much sound these tiny eight-legged creatures can make. Just listen to this. I took the audio and I transformed it. I transformed some of the sounds by allowing them to map onto my keyboard, which allowed me to create melodies and chords. Some of them I stretched or reduced in length to fit within my beat and meter. Some I left alone. In the end, I created a new piece of art named after a particular genus of the wolf spider that Eileen studies, Schizocosa. And outside of noise itself, every sound in the piece was originally produced by an arachnid. At the same time, I was collaborating with Professor Orida on this project. Along with her dancers, she was explored what it meant to be a spider, to have spiders on you, inside you, and a part of you. She researched the literature of spiders, such as the Itsy Bitsy Spider, as well as Eileen's writings, and then improvised around them. The dancers are not trying to be directly representational. They're not mimicking spider movements. Instead, they use the human form to bring us inside the world of the arachnid. Together with the combined art forms of dance and music, we found a way to transform Eileen's research into something new, something beautiful, and something profound. Schizocosa has indeed become an entry point into the fascinating world of arachnids. We have performed it at dance festivals, music concerts and festivals, science conventions, and at showings of Eileen's traveling science exhibit, Eight-Legged Encounters. There was an alchemical process where the arts relied on the underlying research of the scientist, yet at the same time opened doorways, entry points for understanding, into the world around us. Perhaps now you understand what I mean when I say the arts don't need ideas. It's when ideas meet the arts, they become compelling in visceral ways. They become even more powerful. In this shortened version of the piece, I invite you to experience a fabulous example of how the arts can transform concepts and ideas into emotional experiences. And now, Schizocosa. <laughs> 